I am very pleased to reintroduce Stephen Hart with our closing panel of the day. And for those who don't know, Stephen uh, does not only work at SANS, but is a top podcaster. Stephen has also helped other people become very successful podcasters and has been able to share their voices and elevate them from one download to top of the charts. So that's what we're going to talk about next with podcasting and building your brand. Take it away, Stephen. Thank you so much, Ladrina. Appreciate it. I have thoroughly enjoyed today's invaluable presentations and I hope you have as much as I have. Um, so thank you to everyone who has taken part in today's um, forum. Um, today we are uh, so excited to, to be sharing in a panel discussion with um, some amazing folks, Info Steph, Chris Cochran, and Ron Eddings. Um, I um, am grateful to you. Yesterday actually was uh, the celebration of International Podcast Day. And, um, and so just wanting to, to, to big up each of you as podcasters, um, give you props for, you know, bringing your ideas to life. Um, and, and so um, that said, you know, Janae and, and Stephanie um, earlier on an earlier panel talked about the importance of branding ourselves. And so before we jump in, I'd love for each of you to take two minutes, uh, introduce yourselves, but more importantly, if you could just share what building your brand means to you. So maybe we'll, we'll kick off ladies first. <laughs> I was hoping you didn't pick me first. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is uh, Stephanie. I am kind of known on uh, Twitter as InfoSteph. That's why he introduced me as that. Um, I'm a security analyst by day and I do a variety of things by night. Um, branding to me is kind of like it's important to me specifically because I don't like to sell anything. I like for the product to speak for itself, so to speak. Um, so having good branding helps you not have to be so aggressive when it comes to selling yourself, which is great because it's a weakness of mine. So that's what I'd say. Fantastic. Ron. Hey everyone, Ron Eddings here. Um, security architect by day podcast host by night, a uh, podcast host of Hacker Valley Studio. Love building it out and seeing where it goes. I, we, we started for, um, you know, really unique reasons. We had so much that we wanted to share with the industry. We've been working hard to accrue all of this information over time and we wanted to give it back. We wanted to promote information to others that were like us. You know, Chris and I both, we grew up in minority households. We didn't have a lot of role models around us. So it meant so much when we could have these conversations with these leaders, experts, and then give that back to our community and also learn along the way. There's a huge learning aspect when it comes to us podcasting and branding ourselves. We get to continually grow. I, I look at myself as a lifelong learner and teacher. And when I get to teach something, I get to learn it twice. And Chris. How's it going, everybody? Chris Cochran, co-host of Hacker Valley Studio. I would say, um, so by day, I do director of security engineering for a financial technology company, but really at night is where Ron and I really get to focus on amplifying voices from all around the world. I think in the beginning, it really started as amplifying our own voices, you know, because we had something to say, but as we kind of went along, we were really finding ourselves amplifying the voices of others, which is one of the, the most beautiful things I think that a podcaster can do is show those beacons of uh, representation for not just yourselves, but for other people as well. And so really, it, it's funny because that personal brand stuff really started with Sands. I mean, Jen can tell you that I, I started with a little five minute lightning talk uh, for a CTI summit. And then it, it, that just snowballed into all this other craziness. So excited to be here, honored to, to be able to represent podcasting, cybersecurity, and also minorities. That's fantastic. And I'll just share, you know, I, I actually have a podcast myself, trailblazers.fm, which is not cybersecurity related. Uh, but four and a half years ago, thought, you know, I would love for my daughter, then probably about four years old, 
to see representation of people that look and sound like her doing amazing things that they're passionate about. And so started a podcast um, and now some 200 episodes later, um, you know, really excited about what that has been able to do. Right. And, um, and so to Camille's earlier point, um, this has really evolved to, to kind of help tell my narrative. Um, so uh, Chris and Ron, uh, wanted to start with, with both of you. Um, they're literally, I, I think last we looked at it, over 700,000 podcasts in the Apple podcast directory right now. And as two black men in cybersecurity, what's the importance of your respective voices and being authentic, right? Um, Probably allow you to to jump on that before I expand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can start us out. Um, when we look at podcasting, it's turned into an essential fabric of our society. Like everyone is consuming content, some type of audio content in some way. A lot of individuals look at podcasting. A lot go to audiobooks. So there's uh, quite a bit of ways to really get your voice out there and share what you know, or at least what you're thinking. Um, and when we first started, we wanted to uh, kind of get behind the mics and highlight some of the aspects that we knew about. But we, we've noticed that in cybersecurity and technology, there's this uh, concept of upgrading software and making it more secure and making it perform better. But there's little attention focused on upgrading the human and upgrading our minds. So we wanted to bring that, that unique kind of uh, perspective into cybersecurity. And that's kind of how we got shifted into focusing on the human element of cybersecurity and which ultimately made us better humans ourselves. Yeah. And Stephen, I, I got to tell you, when we started this, we really just started as an excuse to talk to really intelligent people. <laughs> and, you know, maybe we'd have a couple listeners in our neighborhood, maybe, uh, you know, in our group of friends. But if you were to tell me a couple years ago, that two black men would be able to have listeners in a hundred countries, I would have said you're crazy. Like that I think is the biggest eye opener for me is that we have listeners all over the world from different cultures and we're two black men. I, you know, you have this thing where uh, in old Hollywood, they downplayed, you know, black representation because they said, oh, the market's not there. But with podcasting and the, the reach that you can have, it's unbelievable. And so we have you know, listeners from all over the place. And authenticity is super important to us because I believe that human beings, they can tell when somebody's being inauthentic. Even if you see it in a writing, if you see it in a commercial, if you see someone giving a presentation, you can see inauthenticity in them. So like with us, it, it would only shoot ourselves in the foot to be inauthentic. And you don't grow that audience by being inauthentic, by being completely who you are, you know, sh you know giving your viewpoints, Maybe people don't agree, agree with you all the time, like case in point, like for our, our podcast, some people are like, hey, forget all this human element stuff. Let's just talk about, you know, threat intelligence or, or let's talk about engineering. But it's who we are as people. Ron and I, we constantly push the envelope of the, the human experience, that, that performance level. So that's who we are and we're going to continue to do that. And I think that's why people love the stuff that we're doing. Yeah. Steph, did you want to expand on that any? Uh, yeah, I, I think what he, what he what Chris said is definitely right on the money in terms of what um, me and my co-host are doing on our podcast. Yeah. Um, we call ourselves Happy Hour Inspired because, you know, we just noticed that with security professionals or tech professionals, period, some of the best moments are when you're having random conversations during the con, after the con, before the con, uh, you know, and just like communicating with people and seeing where they're at personally. And like he said, you know, we are human beings that operate machi machinery, but that doesn't mean that we become machinery. We are still humans. And a lot of us are also being adults, you know, for the first time too. A lot of the people that listen to us or they are transitioning to different parts of different career paths at later ages, things like that, where these conversations kind of aid in your own professional development too, because you knowing yourself better and you having more peace surrounding that and being more, um, having more agency over your life and more power over your life and the decisions you make, your life just 
changes drastically. So we tend to have very esoteric conversations <laughs> about digging deep into the human mind and the motivations and what has built us up to this point. Yeah. And that is because that is us, <laughs> as well as a lot of people that listen, they resonate more with that. You can find kind of, you know, a walkthrough or some sort of tutorial literally anywhere. Um, but some of these conversations you can't find in our space from practitioners. So yeah, I, I just wanted to agree with what you said. I love that you touched on that because I think podcasting is, is so, such an inviting place to the niche right, to dialing into a very defined niche and an audience. Um, what's been your experience in, in the ways in which you've connected and impacted your tribe, your, your communities? Anybody go first or? <laughs> Feel free, Steph, jump in. Um, I would say it, it's just been interesting seeing what, sometimes we'll do an episode and we're like, ah, eh, we don't know if people are gonna really, you know, mess with that. <laughs> I'm not sure if people really like that. And then, you know, we get these really crazy DMs that, you know, end up being these conversations or people that say, oh my God, I thought I was the only one that thought this, or I thought that I was the only one that was going through this. So really for me, it's been having these moments of vulnerability with people that, you don't see, you don't talk to, you're not even sure if they're a real human on the other end. Mm. Um, and having these kind of connecting scenarios or situations or experiences that I just can't have anywhere else. And they're a product of the conversations that we have. Um, mm. Or some people saying that they have grown and they have taken some of the stuff, the practices that we've done or the, the ways in which we're working on ourselves, they've practiced it themselves and have changed habits or things like that. So just being able to walk alongside people that you're not actually walking alongside has been a very great reward to me or for me. Yeah. You know, you touched on vulnerability um, and, and the vulnerability of being authentic and real with your tribe and your community. And, you know, I'd pause my podcast for probably eight months and coming back, I never paused a show before. And I thought I can't disappear after publishing 200 weeks of episodes and disappearing for eight months. How do you come back and not address your absence and got really vulnerable and almost too vulnerable, you know, and, and when you create that kind of content, agree with me, you know, if you feel this, but um, you create the content and then before it publishes, you're freaking out almost, right? You're, you're worried. How, how are people going to receive that? Um, and about two hours after I published an episode a couple of weeks back, talking about, you know, the mental exhaustion and, and mental health and building mental strength. About two hours after someone reached out to me um, via DM, Stephanie, and said, hey, I'm sitting in my car. This is in the morning. He's on his way to a work trip, downloaded the episode at five, listened to the episode, he's bawling because he was in my exact situation and it addressed exactly what he needed to do next. And, and so, you know, sometimes it's, it's those level-headed, you know, just pouring out what you really feel and having that human element as Chris and Ron talk about, you know, and, and creating that connection um, that actually, you know, forget the downloads, right? It, that yeah. that um, has so much more impact um, than one, anything else. But one thing that is so powerful about what you just said, that story you just gave is that when we talk about representation, usually we're talking about populations, but also representation of circumstance, representation of feelings. If, like, let's say we all go for a run and everyone seems to be completely fine, but you're dying inside. You're like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this. But if you look over and you see somebody else like dying with you, you're almost like, okay, at least I'm not by myself in this. I'm not in this fight by myself. So if you see somebody that's, you know, hey, you know, I was struggling with this. I, I overcame it. This is how you give people that, that light at the end of the tunnel, because a lot of times, you know, we're so egocentric and not in a bad way, but egocentric because we're stuck in our own minds. Mm -hmm. And if we can see somebody and see ourselves in other people, it makes us feel that much better. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you a, a quick question here. Um, from your experiences, which has been more important creating a content or remaining consistent and, and getting the content out on, on a frequent basis? I think being consistent is a bit more important than focusing on creating the content. Cause as you just 
maintain your consistency, your content's going to get better. You might have an opportunity to talk to more individuals. You might have a opportunity to sharpen your saw and kind of get sharper in a specific area, whether it's technology, just the interpersonal skills or understanding others. So I think being consistent is so important. Me and Chris, we, we strive to, to do our weekly show and now we're doing a new format, which is seasons. And it's a lot of work, but we know the more work that we put into our brand ourselves, the sharper that we're gonna, that we're gonna become. Yeah, I love that. Um, Steph, Stephanie, I wanted to, to pick your brain about, because I, I think you, you blog and, and you're in a couple different places as I was looking at you online, right? Um, is why, why podcasting, right? Why podcasting versus blogs or, or YouTube? Like what is, what, why should somebody, you know, watching or listening in consider um, looking at this channel? So my personal favorite, or I guess what's easiest for me is yeah. writing. I, I have been writing since second grade. I used to enter myself into writing contests in elementary school. So writing for me is like easy. Anything I've ever written never takes me longer than 30 minutes to write. And so for me, it's super, super easy, but the more and more our society kind of evolves, um, the less people have the time to sit and dedicate to reading unless it's really compelling. Mm -hmm. And I'm <laughs> in the vein that Chris is talking about, authenticity is kind of a part of my personality. And so I can't do the whole clickbait and did my boyfriend leave me and then have like uh -huh. an article that has nothing to do <laughs> with that. <laughs> so the bait and switch is definitely not my thing. Um, so I kind of was looking for other ways to, you know, kind of grow because just because something's easy and a, maybe a talent of yours doesn't mean that you you do that forever and that's the only thing that you do. Sometimes you can branch out. Video is a little uncomfortable because I feel like you gotta be like this all the time. And so <laughs> <laughs> because of that, I was like, how can I, you know, communicate, get my voice out there. What's another medium that's a little bit less intimidating? And voice was was the next best thing. Also, at the time, not a lot of people, well, it's funny, there was like a wave of people that were like, oh, I'm starting a podcast. <laughs> By the time, I think it was still like a newer-ish thing that I started to think about doing it. And then in general, I just felt like, I've been told many times that my voice is soothing and that, <laughs> that people would listen to me. Like even speaking gigs, people afterwards will come and say, oh, you know, your voice is really <laughs> soothing and warm. And so I was like, okay, so I guess these are multiple signs that this might be an avenue for me. And I love it a lot because like I said, you could just show up however and <laughs> just talk and focus on what you're saying rather than, oh, I've got to get the lighting right. Oh, I've got to get this recording right. I've got to step this up on this tripod across the way and and that whole drama that is associated with video editing so that's why i personally chose it i think it's also it also allows a certain level of control people don't i think there's distance between you still because when you see video of people i think there's some kind of connection that people might be able to get from you mm -hmm. and so when you meet them there's a familiarity that makes things kind of awkward, <laughs> especially as a woman that's just like going through life by herself, that would be very weird. So I, I like voice because there's still that distance of like, I know I listen to you every week and I know I hear your voice and it matches, mm -hmm. but I still know I don't know you. So I haven't gotten those super familiar kind of interactions that I would get after like a speaking gig or something like that. So mm -hmm. those are reasons why I personally pick them. Um, yeah. And that's, pretty much, I don't know, but I'd be curious to hear what the guys say about why they chose. <laughs> I definitely want to hear what Chris and Ron said, but you just touched on a gem. Your voice is part of your brand. Right? Yeah. Your voice yeah, is true. a big part <laughs> of your personal that. brand. I, yeah. I, for one, used to hate the sound of my voice. And I realized like a good part of my listenership, you know, could be from the Caribbean and they just related to hearing this Jamaican accent, um, which is now a mashup because I've been here like 27 years, but. <laughs> i let let Chris and Ron chime in on that. Yeah, I think our voice is one of those tools that we've worked on. I think we have a, a little bit of natural talent, but Ron and I, we both had a coach for quite some time, about three months to really focus on like honing that craft because we, we take this, this trade craft seriously. We, we didn't want to come in half stepping. We wanted to come in and actually like 
step in with power, step in with grace. And so we really like honed that, that craft. I think Steph really nailed it when it comes to video. There's a lot that has to go into video to make it nice, crisp, and clean. We actually had a video component a long time ago with our, our podcast, but it wasn't to the degree that our audio quality was. And so we just completely nixed it. We do do live streams and things like that on, on LinkedIn, but we really focused on audio being our, the place where we were masterful. I love the way you kind of just gently, you know, put over, oh, we're on, we're on streaming. I mean, every time I log into LinkedIn, uh-huh. I see a video of Chris and Ron. <laughs> 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 to, and so let's talk about that because I wanted to talk a bit about um, how you are leveraging other platforms to be able to amplify the awareness of your podcast. So, you know, could you speak to LinkedIn? Because I mean, I'll see you guys doing a LinkedIn newsletter and I'm like, what's a LinkedIn newsletter? (laughs) You know, you guys are doing so much. So talk to me maybe, you know, a bit about LinkedIn and and how that's being leveraged to help grow your podcast. You know, one of the, before we even talk about LinkedIn, I think Sands was our first pot, uh, our first platform as Chris was describing before we had our podcast. And when it was first starting out, we just wanted to be in front of Sands. We just wanted to be in front of you all and, and talk to everyone that wants to, you know, watch these Sands events. We wanted to podcast at Sands events. So we really looked at that as a platform, but LinkedIn uh, has been really amazing because there's, it's a, it's a professional network. We're not, you know, bashing each other. We're not, uh, we're, it's very positive. It's motivation. And it's also opportunities out there for uh, jobs and content. Uh, so we really took that and, and ran with it. We want to promote as much diversity in the field as possible. And we want to open up as many opportunities as possible. So by opening opportunities, talking about SANS events, talking about jobs available, Chris is hiring like crazy, my team hires. So we just try to like shake it up as much as possible. And there was a bit of luck that came into place too. So when Chris uh, started his last job at one of the most popular streaming companies, I won't name the name, um, (laughs) he had a, a post that went viral. And we looked at that as an opportunity. We were like, all right, we have to, you know, take this opportunity and, you know, leverage our platform and get in front of as many people as possible. LinkedIn has a lot of uh, features. We're seeing new things like the newsletter that, yep. that Chris found. It's been amazing. Um, but there's a lot of things that you can do when it comes to these platforms. I think they're really under leverage. And there's a, a huge opportunity to also provide feedback to others. So LinkedIn recommendations, writing someone a recommendation goes a long way. And there's a book called The Formula. Mm -hmm. And The Formula talks about how to kind of win a Nobel Peace Prize. Like what is the formula behind that? And it's typically through collaboration. LinkedIn is one of those collaborative tools where you get to shout someone out for a highlight that they've done, something great. I found out about uh, Stephanie through LinkedIn. I was following Sands and I saw that you were speaking at an event back in July. So I was like, all right, I need to know Steph. Like I need to get to know who she is. She's, you know, a, a, uh, a voice in the community. Like how do I get in front of her? So that was the first attempt. And now the second attempt is great to meet you, Steph. I hope that we stay in touch, but LinkedIn was really that bridge to get us here and also get us further in the future. I love that. And <clears throat> probably the gem right there is not to immediately connect with somebody on LinkedIn and jump in their DMs and start soliciting, (laughs) right? That's the challenge, but you try. (laughs) (laughs) But LinkedIn for everyone who is listening in, who has not taken advantage, taken advantage of building out your LinkedIn profile. So very important. There are um, so many more people on Facebook and Twitter fighting for place in that newsfeed where LinkedIn just doesn't have enough content. Um, and so you're getting seen that much more um, in that space. So I, I love that you've leveraged LinkedIn to bring awareness to what you're doing. And I love that connection on how the two of you connected there. Um, let's dial back to podcasting for a second and, and talk, because I'm seeing some questions about, you know, well, what's needed to launch a podcast? How much is this going to cost? Could you guys maybe talk a bit about you know, what your individual experiences were with that, because I think it's different for each of us, right? 
It's as easy and as hard as you would think. <laughs> so there, it costs virtually nothing to start a podcast. If you have a microphone that's decent, there's a lot that you can do. One of our podcasting mentors, uh, Jack Resider from Darknet Diaries, he uses an old mic to do his podcasting because he wants to leave an element of uh, growth for himself and not just go with the high-end equipment. So there's a, a lot that you can do there. And one of the hardest things for us actually is coming up with questions beforehand. Like when we could just conversate and naturally speak to someone, it's very easy for us. But if it's kind of on that scripted lines, it's harder to bring out our authenticity. It's harder to kind of encapsulate our personalities beforehand rather than on the spot. So I would say like it really depends on uh, you as an individual and that's going to determine what is hard or, or easy about uh, creating a podcast. I'd have to agree on that. It really depends on yourself because if, for instance, if you're someone who can take six months to plan something and actually do it, then take that time, raise the money, do whatever, make the production you want. If you're someone who spends a lot of time dreaming <laughs> and does not follow through on certain things, sometimes just using literally anything, your phone and doing a voice note and trans transferring that into it. The audio probably is not going to be as good, <laughs> but I think as you go along, um, like I think Ron said earlier, you improve and you, you get better and, and less and less time you'll find people go actually to the beginning. Typically it's like true fans that will go back to the beginning and listen to everything anyway. So I would say just start. Our first episode is really bad because the audio was messed up. <laughs> but we were like, if we don't do it now, we're never going to do it. So we're just going to keep it up. And even when debating, do we just redo it? You know, we're like, I don't know, because it speaks to the growth that we've had in this time. So yeah, I, I would say you can find any. I got a, my first mic was like 30 bucks. And then I just decided I was going to just take it and roll with it. And if the audio sounded bad, I just upgrade as things progress. But you really don't need too much. I think worrying about where to host it is probably a, a, the primary thing and then getting it distributed. But after that's done, pretty much everything's done. Yeah. Jim's right there. I, I still use the same $70 ATR 2100 microphone that I bought five years ago. I've never changed wow. it. And I plug my ATR into my MacBook Pro and... I, I've been recording over Zoom for years, yeah. um, and I personally hate editing audio, so I choose to spend that coin to have a, a producer edit for me, um, but it, it can be as expensive as you really want it to be. Mm -hmm. A couple other things to keep in mind as you are preparing, uh, if, if you're thinking about starting a podcast, uh, things like giving thought to what style of podcast, what format, right? Is this going to be interview style? Is it going to be storytelling? Is it going to be rant, right? Um, or a mix of. Um, also thinking now the, the functionality of podcasting has improved to where you don't have to create a podcast every single week or every other week. You could do it by seasons. Like Ron and Chris um, just recently did with your blue and red series, right? Um, so you can do it seasonal, you can do it ongoing. Um, also to, you know, just think about what that recording element looks like for you and what's going to be, you know, the best thing. I mean, you have audio hosting platforms like Anchor that you can pretty much get your audio loaded to and, um, and get it up and running for little to nothing. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of options out there. Um, but as we kind of head into this, this, um, this 10 minute window, um, before we close, wanted to ask your advice, um, each of you to, to share, you know, what is, um, something that our listeners, this is the end of today's forum. Um, what should each of the people that have attended today, um, do to help improve their brand? Um, and, and whether that's, you know, starting a blog or a podcast or even beyond that, right? In cybersecurity, what can they do this week that's going to help them to improve um, their personal brand? If, if I could bucket advice into something small and concise and digestible, I would say find it, don't force it. 
So find that medium in which you feel comfortable and operating, but don't force yourself to, you know, be like that, that zany character on, on LinkedIn or on YouTube or, or rant on, on Twitter or, you know, you know, have, have a dark net diaries type of, of podcast, like just, just play around, have a little bit of, of self exploration and experimentation and then find where you, you, your niche, find your niche and be authentic and, and get feedback from people as well. Because even if you're, you're putting out stuff that's authentic, it still might need some polish, right? There might be some things that you need to tweak and tune to make it better and, and more accessible and more palatable for people. But I would say, you know, don't force it. Don't force yourself into this, this thing that you don't necessarily want to do and continue because that's where pod fade comes from. Pod fade is usually at that seven episode mark is where people are like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Probably because you weren't in alignment with your personal values. You weren't in alignment with your audience, your community. But if you find that nexus through, through finding it rather than forcing it, then you'll be able to continue with no problem. I think my feedback would be to play like you have nothing to lose. Um, you know, when you, when you take it so seriously and you're worried about what are people going to think and how are people going to perceive it, it's going to ultimately affect your message. Just it's gonna, your, your message is now tainted with thoughts that you think others are having. So I think if you're playing like you have nothing to lose and you're just uh, creating the content that you want, whether it's blog, video, podcast, maybe all three if you have the time and effort. But um, if you have nothing to lose, then you have everything to gain. So I, I, would, I would kind of uh, say that to anyone that wanted to start a podcast or, or promote themselves in any way possible. I'd say uh, be true to yourself and make sure that you remain who you are the entire time. For one, it's just easier um, to maintain that because there's no story you have to think up or any persona that you have to put on. You're just being yourself. So you don't have to worry about somebody, you know, seeing you somewhere and then you're like, oh crap, like I got to remember who I am to them. Um, so being authentic and staying true to the content that you want to put out no matter what is very important, but also not tying your value to these types of things. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting a response that you want or it's not growing as much as you want, or if you get some bad feedback or something like that, making sure that you recognize that this is just an extension of you and not you is important. This is, I know that this is kind of an art that we create. And I know that anyone who creates, you know, you get sensitive about certain things, but really any feedback is helpful in some way, even if it's from a very not helpful source. Um, but yeah, those are the two things that I would say about this uh, journey and good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'll add to the amazing points you just shared. Um, I always tell, and I feel like Janae actually earlier today talked about this and, and it, it's something I, I share with new podcasters asking me about stepping into the space and it's, hey, what's your vision, right? What's, what's your big 30 year vision? Um, you look out to, you know, being in your seventies and you look back, um, hopefully I'm on a beach in Jamaica somewhere at that point in time. But what would you have wanted to accomplish in your life? And Camille talked about not pocketing yourself necessarily in having your narrative um, wrapped around your employer. So when you look at your big picture vision 30 years out from now, and you've, are, you're able to get that down on paper, you know, reverse engineer that, right? Um, and I, I bring that back to, I forgot who it was that created the, the uh, term of a BHAG, your big, hairy, audacious goals. Um, you know, looking at, well, what do you want to accomplish in the next 10 years? I did this exercise four years ago and, you know, this podcast was one of those things um, that I wanted to do and it helped amplify the why that Chris just talked about. Um, that helps you to keep the, the, the wheel turning when you don't feel like um, necessarily creating content um, all the time. Uh, and so, you know, having that mission, having that big picture vision, then informs that shorter term mission work that needs to get done the day to day tasks, because podcasting is not necessarily easy. It's easy to be able to, you know, work through it. 
but don't think it's just, you know, plug and play and it's easy. It does take work. I am a husband and a proud dad to two crumb snatchers that bother me all day when I'm not working for Sans. And so people say, hey, you know, how do you podcast? That's something that I do oftentimes at night, right? When the kids are down. But coming back to this um, and to close this up is understand that vision, understand that mission and be very clear on who you're serving. Uh, understand your audience. Um, Again, in podcasting, it's not about serving everyone. I, I believe, and I've said a million times, if you're serving everyone, you're serving no one in particular. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a great place to be able to say, hey, you know, this is exactly who I'm speaking to and speaking up for. Um, and yeah, I've done that with Trailblazer successfully. Yeah, I don't have the downloads of many other mainstream podcasters, but engagement and the value of the content we create is amazing. So if you're thinking about this, if you're thinking to start a podcast, I'd encourage you to give thought to that vision uh, work and that why that Chris talked about and, you know, dial back, make sure you, you put this on paper, um, get it out your head so you can edit and optimize that and, um, and get clear on who you're serving and understand the problem that they have and how you can help to solve it through the content that you create. And if you're doing that and you're doing it consistently, as Ron talked, touched on, um, you'll begin to build that tribe and that audience and, um, and things begin to grow and evolve from there. So I just want to thank each of you for your amazing gems of wisdom and thank everyone that has, you know, been, been with us throughout the day. I'd invite Ladrina to jump back in and join me here as we wrap up. And thank you very much, guys. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.